Okay. Well, with that, thank you, everybody, for coming back to Jetson AI Lab. Today is Tuesday, October 29th. And uh, up on the agenda, we have uh, Rob from NASA JPL to present some of the latest stuff that they've done in the Ross Rosa project. Including, um, sorry, there was somebody uh, making background noise there. It, including a really cool connector for Isaac Ross. And they have a really big paper that they've uh, recently released and has a lot of really good details about uh, like the finer aspects of agent building and all of those things from the real world experiences testing all this stuff. Uh, and then also Chris wanted to present a walkthrough of his Oasis project that powers the uh, Iron Man augmented reality mask. Because uh, he's done a lot of really great work open sourcing that and has grown to like encompass a lot of areas of Gen AI, much like projects from this group, uh, including like LLM and, and voice stuff. And really appreciate all of that work, Chris. And I know you've also been working with Dave and other members of the group, including the JPL guys are like, oh, we love that helmet. And um, yeah, it's great to see that project taking off so well. Uh, and then also, Cavalan has been uh, really busy at the uh, AI Summit in India. Actually, like met Jensen there and presented a great demos at the booth using vision language models and Isaac Sim as Kaya robot, everything. So it's really incredible work there with all the workshops that, that you've been doing, Cavalan. So hats off uh, again to you. And um, it's been a really in incredible watching you like take off with all this stuff. Um, so with that, uh, I guess we'll turn it over to uh, the JPL guys and Rob, if if you're there and just wanted to start screen sharing. Otherwise, I'm happy to start with walking people through uh, some of the latest info that's come out in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, hey. Um... I'm here, I'm on two devices, and uh, the device okay, that's no meant problem. for video is not putting my camera through for whatever reason. I assure I, you I, the, the, the privacy flap is not down. I just can't see my camera. Gotcha. Yeah, um, no problem. We're happy to give you a minute here. Or uh, you can also drop links and like I can share this stuff. No biggie. Yeah, cool. Okay, you want me to share the uh, your GitHub? I'm happy to do that. Let's get started with that a while. Yeah, it's it's kind of a, a landing page for everything else. The, the paper is linked there. So a bunch of videos are linked there. Yes. All right. You can speak to things, and I'm happy to um, follow along for the group here. Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't want to. I don't want to go too much into into things because I'm sure a lot of you have. I've seen it. Um, I've been trying to get the word out quite a bit, and, and thanks to Dustin for that as well. Um, so basically, Rosa is the Roz agent. Uh, it is an AI agent that has access to a lot of the Roz tools that you might use um, in a typical Roz system. Uh, so that includes things like, you know, Roz node list or Roz do topic info and, and other CLI tools. Um, and also all the Python tools that Roz comes included with. Um, and the idea here is you can um, you can use natural language to ask the robot to do things. And more recently, we built this Isaac Sim extension that not only controls the robot, but can also control Isaac Sim. So in this case, we're asking it to start the simulator and then do some things with the robot. And so it actually interacts with the timeline. In this case, it just starts it, but they can stop it, pause it, and, and do things like that. Um, and yeah, the, the extension is open source. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had much time to, to document things, so it's it's in a weird state right now. Um, it is on GitHub, but I, I wouldn't recommend you go and try it unless you are familiar with extensions. And I'm, I'm working on documentation to make that process easier. Um, but you can see here the you know you ask the agent to give you diagnostics about the sim 
and it uses like the internal Isaacson APIs and, and libraries to, to do that. Um, and then if you wanted to run simulation in headless mode, for instance, you can do that as well. And you could use the standard ROSA interface um, to, to interact with the robot inside of Isaacson. Um, I don't think the extension works in headless mode, and that kind of makes sense. So I'm trying to figure out how to get it to control Isaac Sim without Isaac Sim running, um, or while it's running in, in headless mode, I should say. Um, and there's some other weird nuances that we're trying to, to figure out, like um, <clears throat> under certain circumstances, the um, Isaac Sim will, will lock up after certain commands. Uh, like for instance, I could share my screen here pretty soon, and we can kind of play with this if you guys want. But um, did, did I, I gave it the ability to load. What's yeah. that? I said, did you get your screen sharing for work, Rob? Oh, um, yeah, I think screen sharing works. It was just camera that oh, was not okay. working. Okay. All right. Here, I'll pass it off to you then, so you can just show it. Okay. Cool. There we go. Uh, so nice. I have. Okay. Great. Yes. Uh, so, so Isaacson is running here, and um, you basically have this extension that creates a little UI um, for anyone who's not familiar with Isaacson, and more importantly, not familiar with the Isaacson extensions. Basically, what it looks like is you get this. Uh, let me collapse all these. Um, you can you can use um, Isaacson itself to create one of these extensions, it gives you a template. And then basically all you have to do is kind of like populate um, this extension.py with your UI. Um, and we did that here. So we gave like a submit, a clear stop and reset button along with like a text input. And then I gave it a few other little features like an update output box and a, a final result box, things like that. Um, and then we defined, um, and prompt for the Carter, and actually this is not the Nova Carter, it's the original Carter. Um, and then we gave it a set of tools. So these tools are what plugs into Rosa. Um, so these are all the timeline tools, for instance, the uh, start timeline, it's pretty simple. Um, basically, I, I don't wanna say wrapper, but it is pretty much a wrapper around the timeline.play function that you would get out of Isaacson's um, you know, timeline API. Um, and yeah, so these are all the timeline tools. Um, this is the diagnostics tool. We do a little bit more work to give the agent or really the LLM more context. Uh, so we, we describe the data that it's going to see and, and how all of that fits together. And you could also um, give it instructions in the response of these tools. So we'll say the stats are provided below. Uh, please do your best to interpret them and provide a summary. Um, and we try to make things as easy for the agent as possible to make sure it doesn't uh, hallucinate or come up with its own facts and figures and things like that. Um, but yeah, you can see we have a lot of um, tools for Isaac Sim. We have um, the ability to load a USD uh, to get a list of available USDs. In this case, it's a hard-coded list, but you could you could imagine doing something uh, more intricate where you look for the USD files in a certain path and so on. Um, we have a few Carter tools. So there's the, the move, um, you know, forward, backward, turn in place. Um, right now we're using the most basic version of the Carter robot um, to do this, but we want to kind of beef it up and give it some more cool, interesting things. Um, and then last but not least, we have like some camera tools. So, you know, like the, the recent demos that I'm seeing, everyone's doing like, a, you know, move and then describe what you see in the camera kind of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, the novelty does wear off kind of quickly when you're looking at these demos, because after a while, you don't really care what the robot sees and you want it to do some more interesting things. Um, but these are kind of like good starting points. Uh, and, and this was really like the stuff that we use for proof of concept. Um, and again, all of this is open source. You could go through this if you want to. Yes, um, even, but, even just this stub code is very useful because it shows the difference between the connectors to SIM and to ROS. Because last right. time you walked us through us, it was all these 
tool wrappers for the ROS functions. And now it's ones for Isaac Sim. And in the future, we think about like Isaac Lab or other robot learning frameworks like LayRobot that Jitoku has been working on. And I have been keeping uh, Rosa in mind for like these robotics projects that hope to be able to spend more time on and have Rosa be the higher level control agent for those. And um, I remember we talked previously, Rob, about the differences between the GPT-4 function calling ability and what you have found with local models like Llama 8B or similar levels to that. And I have wondered if you played around with those local ones more, if you're still um, doing this with GPT mostly, or have captured more data sets. What's the what, what's your latest thoughts with that? Yeah, um, as far as like quality of results, GPT 4.0 is still king. Um, it it's just it's hard to beat, uh, especially with local models given constrained resources and such. Oh um, yeah, but well, it's, it's almost have... like a whole other approach, you, you know. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And um, I mean, believe me, the, the value of local models is not lost on us. Like everything we do, we want to maintain privacy and security and, and safety. So having local models is pretty huge. A lot of things we do at JPL with LLMs can't be done with any provider. They have to be done locally, uh, just given the nature of the data that we're working with. So um, yeah, we, we have been looking at that a lot. And Chris, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering as far as like function calling, um, when when your model doesn't nat natively support it, or you know you're not using something like OpenAI, which has the API for it, have you tried just telling the model how you want it to reply, and then using that reply to to process? Like uh, I've done, I did something recently where I said I want you to reply like this, use this JSON format, and then that's how it replied, and I just processed that locally. Yeah, yeah, totally. That that's a totally valid approach, and that was actually some of the earlier approaches that we saw for um, integrating these with robotics. Was they they did things through through JSON. There's some problems with that, um, potential problems with that uh, validating and and things of that nature. Um, but it's totally doable. Um, the good thing, though, in my opinion, is that. Um, most of the more recent and capable models, like like Llama 3.1, um, Mixtral, and recently Nemotron from NVIDIA, they all support tool calling out of the box. Okay. Um, so, so it's, it's becoming less of a problem. And to me, that approach is nicer because you kind of have it handled for you. Um, so you don't have to come, kind of come up with these custom parsers. And um, you know, some people are even using um, like What's the word? Uh, parsers, lectures, and then there's another one. But and yeah, the point is, what's it's that? in open. It's in Olama now and MLC, yeah. and the, so for at this point, for people just doing text LLM, I just recommend they spin up those servers because it even does the function calling supporting that. Um, Mizeko was chiming in that like, yes, that is doable. I know he has even lower latency stuff like we had um, done earlier in the summer which is like in process. Um, but I, I think even if you, you will likely still have challenges with this llama out of the box, but with some fine tuning for it, I, it should do really well, I feel. The challenge being collecting that um, data set to fine tune it that's like kind of specific to these functions or those kind of robotic functions. And in, in your experience, how much like of the recursion does it do when you're calling this stuff? Because that's also um, a limiting factor that I've seen with those those local models. The depth uh, is not as high as you might see with the cloud ones. Uh, when you say recursion, do you mean like in the in the tool calling? Yeah, like how many tools can it call from itself? In, in oh, general? I've I've seen it. Um, successfully execute like a sequence of 10, 15 tools. 
Okay, yeah. that's a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it can go up to 30, and sometimes it might run away with some, some weird notion of what it should do next and, like, just go on a, you know, uh, hit, a, hit a rabbit hole and exhaust its 30 tool limit. Um, but typically, you're looking at, like, two or three tool calls max for, like, the average um, kind of sequence. Okay. Yeah, and then you I've can, like you reliably can hit up to got like two out of the box when just like weather stuff, and I know Ms. Aiko had had done that too. Also, I'm I'm sorry, Colin had had his hand up and had a question. Oh, you you actually asked the question um, uh, about how you know how often were you looping through the model? Um, but I appreciate that, <laughs> like, and um, oh, I I do have another question though, so. Um, what base models have you been kind of messing around with, um, so far? Yeah, so, um, Poro was the, the standard that, you know, we started with. And then, uh, more recently, we're looking at Llama 3.1, 8B, 7, uh, 70B, and more recently, Nemotron, uh, which I have gotten better results with Nemotron than I did with the equivalent Llama 3.170B. Um, so that's kind of like my new gold standard for local yeah. models. It, it's that, a popular model. What's that? That Nemotron is, is doing well. How does how yeah. do those 70Bs compare for you with the function calling? They're they're pretty close and I, I don't have like quantitative benchmarks, but like the vibe is better. <laughs> If you know it, it passes okay. the vibe check a little bit more. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if they do, I w I would have no qualms about just distilling it out of Nemotron seventy B or three hundred four or three forty B. You know, and it, that stuff's like kind of fun to do. Like I've also been playing with the um, NVLM seventy B VLM just for like data curation and stuff, and when they're open models you could just run it through them and if it's good enough record it all and then we can fine tune um like llama 8b on it yeah that's oh, wow a good point. okay interesting yeah yeah i mean not everybody has like a you know 46 gigabyte gpu i mean you, you do with the, the well jetson actually you MGX do or jetson but... yeah i do yeah, yeah. <laughs> on that like well, i can show later all these vlm training benchmarks i've been doing with x tuner for combining slms and latest vits and all that and that's what i've been looking at in turn uh, vl and and vlm for but yeah it has 64 gigs so it's slower to like do stuff with but when you're just doing like sanity checks and um, like getting all the components to work and do test lars and stuff is is actually great for that. So you technically probably already do have the the GPU hardware to to run it, and um, I'll I'm happy to help you do it if you can like get some of these traces of the data sets. Either ideally coming from like one of the open models, I think would um, go over well because I, I had heard actually with since Oro, they were um, starting to like detect when people were recording these agentic intermediary states and and stuff, which makes sense because when I've been looking at this, it those are difficult to solve problems, whereas the embodiment stuff is just kind of comes more natural from for data collection. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do have hooks to collect that that data, all the intermediary kind of reasoning traces and obviously the final results and such. And that that was something that we've been talking about internally, like fine tuning a small language model um, on on Rosa interactions. And that way it would be um, much more viable to use um, without having to take up an entire AGX or in, like worth of memory to, to run and get decent results. I'm totally interested in that. Um, but yeah, so, um, I want to, I want to give Chris's time as well. So, uh, I will just jump into the extension and we'll get some stuff running. I'll show you guys how it works and then I'll pass the baton. So in, in Isaac's dem, um, you can load 
an extension, a custom extension by going to the window, um, drop down, select extension, and then go to third party. Um, you can have it auto load. Uh, in this case, it did, and I just closed it. I'm going to re-enable it. And then you can dock it um, you know, over here, for instance. Um, so as I was saying earlier, the USD, the loading USD thing, sometimes I think it has a race condition or something, the way it's working with the Python library. It works like half of the time, so I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to go ahead and load a scene. But uh, once we fix that, you should be able to just tell it which scene you want it to load. Um, but here we have the Carter um, on Mars, a synthetic Martian terrain. And um, yeah, from here I could basically tell it what I want it to do. Um, so basically what you guys saw in the, the demo video is probably a decent thing to try here. And then I could take some some requests from, from the crowd. Um, so, you know, start the sim, uh, move backward, do a 90 degree spin to the left. Um, and uh, I don't know, just grab the thing. Uh, so it started, it's getting the initial position, going back. You see you have you have the live updates in the extension. And um, you know, pretty pretty simple thing. Again, it's not nothing too complex. Uh, really, it was like a proof of concept and just trying to get Rosa into Isaacson. Um, so it says the Sorry, the text is probably tiny on that screen. I, I didn't find a way to make it bigger in the extension. Um, but it's saying that it sees a rock located about a meter away, another rock, and a boulder. Um, yeah, I don't know which one's the boulder and which ones are the rocks, but yeah, so that's basically it. It's using 4.0 for the, the vision there as well. Um, but Dustin has any great ideas about local vision models, which I totally want to pursue. For this demo, it was, you know, 4.0 is easy enough. Um, and my the device I'm running on here only has, I think, 16 gigs. That's a, it's a 4070 laptop version, so okay. kind of small. Yeah, that, I mean, that is kind of interesting that on that um, environment, it is easier just to call it out. Versus on Jetson, you actually do have the RAM to to run that all, which is, yeah. which is great. Um, Cabalan had a question, which is, doesn't surprise me because he has a kind of similar trajectory of stuff he's been working on. Uh, hi, uh, I have no doubt. Uh, is, is the background uh, AMCL and other algorithms is uh, working on or uh, uh, for the localization and uh, other tasks? How the robot is uh, doing the localization itself? Oh, the localization in this case, it's uh, well, because we're in SIM, we have ground truth. So we have precise coordinates, um, but with with our spot robot, we connected Rosa to that, and we're using the lamp stack, which is developed here at JPL, uh, localization and mapping stack, and I could link you to that okay. as well. Yeah. So let's see. So it, it, it defaulted to launching the uh, other algorithm in the back end of the Isaac sim, or I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? So, uh, other algorithms like uh, AMCL and the MoBase uh, for doing a navigation and uh, the localization part. So, while doing this extension, it will defaultly launch in the back side of this Isaac sim or uh, how it is made of. A oh, that's right. Yeah. So, so ro we're running the ROS bridge with Isaac sim here. Okay. And um, okay. yeah, yeah. So, anything that you can publish across a ROS topic is accessible yeah. to Rosa. So it, it could subscribe yeah. to your, your localization, your ODOM, um, okay. any kind of state estimation that you have, and it could use those okay. values in its calculations. Yeah. Yeah, got it, got it. Yeah. So you, you simply subscribe with the Rosa A with a publishing topic from the Carter robot, right? Yeah, exactly. OK, got it. Yeah, Cabalan, kind of considering like what you've been working on, which is similar to like you've been 
integrating our vision language models on like on device. You have a similar thing with this working with Isaac Sim and on device VLMs and LLMs, speech recognition, um, just in like the warehouse sim environment. Perhaps if you gave Rosa a look and started working your way towards that, we could all kind of like meet there in the middle. Because Rob has like the Rosa piece. You have like the on-device models piece. You're both already using Ross and Isaac Sim, just not exactly the same like agents. But if we all like adopted Rosa, then we could like standardize around that. Yeah, OK, great. Uh, Colin, you had another question, man. Yeah, I'd be interested in helping out as well on the ROSA side. Um, we, we've, we obviously have a LLM on the um, International Space Station National Labs, so it's, it's up in space right now. And we should be right. pushing more stuff to the edge on that NVIDIA device, but uh, we'll we could probably you know, share some of our learnings as we experiment. Great. OK, yeah, that is a very interesting connection. And that, that's right. We had met in DC, Colin, and you had said yeah. you would had previously put like LLMs on the International Space Station and uh, you spoke of a lot of funny anecdotes about the bandwidth limitations and and stuff to that, which is like an issue when we're talking about these like gigantic models, right? Even yeah. Even so. We, I mean, it's an extreme way of localiz localizing it, right? Um, but yeah, we we had to we had a ten gigabyte restraint um, on our Docker container, as well as a um, twenty watt power restraint. Um, so um, okay, yeah, yeah, we we had to get creative and trying to put a rag as up you there. Guys normally do so. Um, okay. So I, I know that uh, we want to give Chris a bunch of time. Rob, maybe, it, unless you had other stuff in Isaac that you wanted to show, maybe if you brought up your paper real quick or dropped a link to that. It is like quite extensive, great paper and like research guide to like dig into all this and really understand some of the ins and outs of like what you guys have already done. I can see, oh, hopefully we can like get behind this and, um, start to contribute some PRs or whatnot with like your guidance of where you would like things to go or enhancements to be made. I can see the porting the local models would probably be an, an initial priority, but um, even just like this code that you have with Isaac Sim and everything is a great start for anybody wanting to integrate these agents together. Yeah, totally. Um... I mean, I'd, I'd love to collaborate with all of you here. Uh, there's only so much that we could do. And even though we're JPL, like we, we, we're we still somewhat constrained on resources. So oh, the yeah. more the merrier. Well, and that's why you did made this great open source project. So yeah, let's rally around that. Because even if we do these like complete end-to-end -end multitask vision language models, basically everybody seems to agree there will still need to be some higher level coordinating agent or multi robot agent i don't know if you've explored that at all yet like what happens if you have two carters or two spots or you have that cool uh, like uh that drone and be able to control multiple robots from one like centralized agent probably another or you might have already looked into that in in the paper but lots of areas for us to explore, I'm sure. Yeah, you're you're totally right. Um, one of the things we wanted to do for the paper, but didn't have time to, it will probably make it to the final release, is to, um, yeah, to operate three robots at the same time and to demonstrate how having this agent to act as like the proxy operator um, can can be super beneficial uh, and help, help reduce like cognitive load on operators and things like that. So I'm totally interested in that. And I, I totally agree that Rosa can be seen as like this high level kind of operator interface that can then go and like control other agents that are specialized, things of that nature. Yeah, what's nice about it is it can integrate at 
any level of the existing stack, which we've already seen in in some of the Gen AI ROS projects that that us in the community have done is like some of them want to augment existing SLAM and navigation systems like Catalan uh, brought up. Others are like complete embodiment and like full neural control. So um, having all those like different options and insertion points available is is great because I believe most folks that have actual robots won't just like turn over like the whole stack. They will want to integrate bits that are have improved performance in them while keeping yeah. like what they know. Yeah. So would. And your other robots like the snakes and stuff look cool too. I love all the the things you guys post. You do a, a lot of awesome uh, platforms. Yeah, we get to work on some pretty cool kind of unconventional robots. It's pretty fun. Yeah, and should you ever get into like the the planetary side of things, it was funny this connection with Chris's Iron Man helmet and it practically being like a next generation space uh, helmet for like astronaut design, maybe something like SpaceX would conjure up. Um, but I guess that could lead us into our next topic, Chris, if you would like to take over the ball from Rob. Sure. Um, but perhaps one minute before we do, Paul, uh, sorry, I didn't realize you had your, your hand up. Um, if you want to ask a question quick. Um, yeah, so uh, we see um, a lot of partnership opportunities from OpenQ Quantify side. So we do generative AI for electronics embedded systems and simulations, and we leverage Cesium with Omniverse, O3DE, and stuff like that for uh, simulating applications. And we see a lot of opportunities um, to pursue um, some really cool simulations for robotics together. Can you um, drop your link in the chat? Because I looked at O3DE, and it, it looked um, good and like it would build um, on Jetson and obviously like Omniverse and Isaac Sim is like crazy photorealistic and parallelizable, oh, but it's also good sometimes to be able to run this and o O3D looked looked nice. Um, yeah, so I'll I'll put my link in the chat. Um, our executive team uh, we have Kyle Fox, the founding CSE of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, myself, Adam Carabin, um, electrical engineer. Uh, we're more than happy to uh, work with you guys. So just contact. Yeah, well, yeah everybody is always welcome to come in the group. And there's various members of this team that range everywhere from just like DIY maker in their attic or garage to research professor startups or actual corporations. Right, and, and, and that's a, are... it's a huge part of the whole cycle. So. Yeah, we are getting like satellite information. So we're getting like real time simulations of 3D digital twin of the whole world within Cesium. Nice. So there's like okay. information, you know, live, live information. Yeah. Um, oh, I had seen this website before. So yeah, thank you for coming on and, and speaking up because you guys have, I have a very interesting <laughs> site. I hope you don't mind me saying, but that whole like nerf to real workflow with like the neural reconstruction for a continuous digital twin that will like train all your VLMs, DITs, multimodal agents and and all that I think is what a lot of us are starting to like hone in on and um, becoming more clear what that looks like for everybody. Yeah. I think the best thing is like people start making their own data, training their own models the and get up into the fine tuning because they really can do like practically anything if you just fine tune them on it. Yep, yep. That's what our team have. So we've been training interns. We're still in the startup phase. We've been training interns, sales team, and all okay. that stuff. So all right. Well, let, let Paul, let, let's catch ground. up at the end because I, I, I do. I promised Chris that we would like to devote time to him. But yeah, you and you, you can come on and talk next time too. Uh, yes. You, you seem great. All right. Th thank you for for saying hello. Um, all right. Sorry, Chris. Uh, please, uh, you can. Start. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll use the time I've got. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, the kind of stuff that I work on here, I'm going to walk you through it uh, and share with you the project. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to drop all of the links in the chat just to begin with. 
and then people can see all the various uh, places. I've got my YouTube channels, uh, the uh, original YouTube channel, Curzy Fabrications, which is there at the top. Uh, the Oasis project, I've created a separate channel for. Not a whole lot there yet, but I'm working on that channel. Uh, I post most of my latest updates, just whatever's on the bench to my Instagram account because it's a convenient place to put it. And then I will be talking about the project, the GitHub, uh, the website for the project later on. So all of that's there in the chat if you want to take a look. Thank you uh, for putting all this together, Chris. Really, I remember you talked about this at GTC. It's like no, no problem. Awesome. No problem. And so this one is probably going to be my most technical deep dive that I've given because of the audience here. Um, I really wanted to try to include as much into this one about the software that I'm using and the capabilities as I could. Um, I want to respect everyone's time and also give people time to ask questions if they have specific um, questions they have about the project. So I've got a lot of slides here, but I'm going to kind of go through them quickly. Uh, if you have any questions while I'm going through it, please feel free to uh, either raise your hand or post it in the chat, and I'll, I'll get to them as as they come up. All right, so um, why did I build this project? How do we get from cosplay to Iron Man, and then what's all uh, involved in that process, and, and why did I do this to begin with? So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Chris Kersey. Uh, I started the YouTube channel Kersey Fabrications about five or six years ago. Um, and I started as a gamer and computer nerd back uh, in high school. Uh, now I am a content creator, cosplayer, software developer, maker, teacher and coach as I get a chance, uh, father and husband. Uh, and I, I posted those in kind of in reverse order. And so let's let's just start with the video that launched this all. So uh, going back into January 2023, I'd been working for about three years uh, in, in somewhat secrecy on this project, uh, seeing what I could accomplish on my own. And I'm just going to pay the beginning of this. I don't know if there's going to be audio. You can give me a thumbs up, Dustin, if you hear the audio on this. If not, I'll just talk over it. I don't think there's audio, Chris. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the Iron Man helmet I built. This is a YouTube video. You can find it on that link. Uh, and this is what the first version of the helmet looked like when you wore it, complete with object detection. Uh, that's the arc reactor where I store the NVIDIA jets in. Uh, and then we go into more about how I built this, what I wanted to include in the helmet. So I encourage you to to watch this video because I wanted to make sure that in this first announcement video that I uh, I included as much of the reasoning behind what I was doing and what I was trying to replicate. Uh, and then this is kind of the latest of where I was uh, back in March of this year. This is the integration of Friday. So that first version uh, was just the HUD component of the of the 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 helmet, but I really did want to add a local AI agent. And back in March, this is where I was with her. I went with Friday instead of Jarvis. Oh, you said you couldn't get audio on this one. You weren't hearing my audio or weren't hearing it very well. And I think it was a good choice to go with something other than Jarvis because we used to have something named Jarvis. And yes, I, like, that was the idea like, was everyone was doing it. Could, like, yeah, enough. it's very know, This is very authentic reproduction. So I don't know if there's a special setting I have to do on my screen share to actually get it to. You have to like undo, you have to unscreen share and then redo. And it, it may or may not be worth it given that. All right. Let's just move forward if, if I want to try it later towards the end, because I did put it here. Um, this this video is also available. This one's on the Oasis channel, so you can watch it as well. This kinds of it's not real time in the video. I did cut it for time. And so uh, please, if you're wanting to know how responsive she is, this one's not representative of that because I did cut it for time. But this does show a lot of the capability that I had at that time. I and you I was lucky that to get to try this Chris at, at GTC and it was amazing really and I've yeah. not really done much AR stuff so this it was 
really awesome. And if you want to see uh, that whole interaction, even with Dusty's trying it on there at GTC, there's a I whole video. That. There's a video <laughs> where I posted the whole walk around or, or segments of the walk around that I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, you can see people's reaction because I was letting pretty much anyone who wanted to try it on, try it on. And uh, one thing I'll talk about later in this presentation is the entire experience is recorded. So due to the built-in encoder, that's available on the Orin NX. I record everything, and so you're getting the whole experience and actually can play back that experience later. That is really interesting in the lens of like the robot learning data collection, isn't it, Chris? Yeah. Um, yeah, and like you working with Dave and like this Rosa agent. Yeah. That, yeah, the, the ability, the fact that we've got uh, on the NX uh, models in particular, we've got the the built-in hardware encoder, it means you're not really taking away anything from the other duties of the, the Jetson when you want to do your, your encoding to disk. And so it's very lightweight to be able to do that. Um, in fact, in my software, and we talk about it more if people have specific questions on it, uh, the only slowdown I have there is because of the way I'm doing frame capturing, uh, and I just haven't optimized it a whole lot, but I'm still getting 30 frames per second of video capture uh on on the device all right moving on to uh where why did i build this to begin with uh basically enthralled by the whole uh, going back to the original iron man movie i thought it was such a realistic portrayal although greatly accelerated uh for the movie uh, of the engineering process he showed how he had machines and how they were building them uh how he was testing and iterating um, and I really enjoyed that whole process. And then, you know, as time went on since 2008, we saw a lot of this technology becoming real. Uh, 3D printing becomes mainstream. Uh, miniaturization is, of course, always getting better in terms of cameras, displays, optics, and then machine learning and AI, which, you know, which is what we're talking about here today. Uh, and I really wanted a cool project. I wanted something that I could kind of take all of these technologies, take all that I've learned by being an embedded software engineer and, and put it to good use. So in 2020, I began this, this project uh, and started working on, on making this real. Uh, also, I'd like to shout out to, there's a YouTube channel called The Hacksmith, who has a channel where he makes it real. And, and that was a big influence on me as well to, to try to turn some of these fictional technologies into something that was usable. Yeah, I remember working with him on this like Jedi training drone and he had like a real life plasma lightsaber and like yes. people be wild. And like you too, Crit, you like literally you made this reality and in in person, this is like feels like a real steel helmet and have like movie industry been in touch with you or no nope, it's nope. like that caliber i get that question a lot has the movies been in touch with me or has the government been in touch with me those are common questions that i get uh, i haven't had contact with either one of them i've shared it with the movie industry uh that you know in this day and age of social media it's pretty easy to get in touch with all kinds of people uh, and i've shared it with them but the movie industry since they are so it doesn't need to be real it doesn't have to be a reality so there hasn't been a whole lot of like interest in bringing this you know on set or anything uh, okay well all of us would like to kickstart <laughs> one or you know i i mentioned this before like look into production options because like people people will buy this um, yeah and we can talk Al. about that in the version two here okay sorry yeah Al, question man you you know that disney has an entire section for robotics and this superhero that you're resembling that you're making belongs to Disney ultimately because it's a Marvel superhero, right? Yes. Marvel belongs to belongs to Disney. So there you go. You got you got a path. There. Disney hasn't contacted me either. So I'm hoping <laughs> maybe if we do get some more Iron Man, maybe with Iron Heart coming up, maybe I'll get a contact from someone. But it, I think since since their movies and their their properties have like gone away from Iron Man a bit due to their stories. I'm hoping as we maybe get some more technology, if we get back into Armor Wars, if we get uh, the Ironheart series, that some of this may become interesting to them again. Um, and, and one comment I wanted to that, make that on. That is a fair point from out. Push come to shove. Like th this tech, you could just create your own version of said helmet. And that's what I was going to, to bring oh. up. So 
Yeah, I mean, this the property, the IP here is is very Disney. It, it's all owned by Marvel, obviously. That's why I've I've leaned into the Oasis project, it being its own thing, it not being associated. The software, right. while inspired by that technology, uh, isn't going to be tied to it forever. In fact, I'm already working with an artist to design my own set of armor and helmet and stuff, things that are my intellectual property. Um, you know, obviously, the idea of a high-tech helmet isn't owned by anyone. We have Cortana and, and you know, uh, um, what am I thinking of? Uh, Halo, you know, and so there's a lot of inspirations I'm pulling from when I'm developing my own version here. Uh, and again, with the whole idea of I'm investing some money in this, I'm actually paying artists to do this, but I'm still going to open source everything. All the models are going to be free because I do want people to recreate this on their own and, and to feel free to uh, be inspired by it and, and iterate on it. Uh, so the tech in here, uh, obviously running in a Jetson or an NX-16, uh, the 8-core ARM, 1024. I don't need to go through all this with you guys. Most of you know it. Uh, but the whole reason I went with NVIDIA Jets, and it was the only platform that could really do everything simultaneously that I wanted it to do. I get a lot of questions about running this on Pi or running this on other hardware, and there's just no no, no other platform that I've had access to has been able to do all of it on, on one device on the edge. And so that's why the, the Jetson is still my go-to platform for this. Uh, it's got dual displays, it's got dual cameras, um, you know, and it's obviously one of the the real advantages to the Jetson, of course, is that I also I can decide whether I want it to run on the ARM cores or do I run it on the CUDA cores or I can rebalance the system if I feel like something is is overtaxed and I need to move something around. Uh, the parallel processing capability is what really makes this possible and what makes everything real time. It is actually an incredible board in that little form factor. Yes. It's like the highest that you can Absolutely. Get size. Yeah. Um, running dual 1440 displays, which gives me a 2880 by 1440 at 120 hertz. That will run real time uh, as long as you're not recording. Again, there's some software issues that I don't record at that rate. I, I back down to the recording frame rate, uh, but that is what it will run without any problems. Uh, due to camera limitations, I have to run the cameras at 1080p at 60 hertz, and then I just frame double and, and you know, do things like that. Uh, but I do get the full 1440 by 1440 per eye. Uh, there's a microcontroller you can see there in the, the image. Uh, the microcontroller at the top of the helmet is a Teensy 4.0. That's where the GPS is hooked up to, the 9 DOF sensor. Uh, humidity sensor, temperature sensor, all of that runs there. And then I send that over USB currently uh, via JSON format that the helmet processes it. It offloads all of that processing, all that real time data. And then I just send the, the compiled version down to the helmet. Why don't you put a carbon monoxide in that, in that helmet? It will look That's, cool. The next <laughs> version will have it. I've actually got several sensors here on the, on the table. Um, so briefly to go through this stack here, uh, software stack is just running in NVIDIA Ubuntu Linux. Uh, the next version I'm hoping to do uh, with a, a Linux from scratch of some sort. Um, the uh, It's all C, C++ for performance reasons and because that's what I code in normally. Uh, GStreamer for all of the video pipelines. Uh, I've got the SDL is what's doing all the 2D graphics. Uh, I was using uh, some of Dusty's code originally for the uh, for the object detection. Uh, I'll be switching to something else once I finally get that uh, re-enabled. Uh, and uh, using uh, enhanced vision and stereo cameras, uh, AI-driven displays, uh, all the text-to-speech and automatic speech recognition is all done locally on the device. Um, I can talk about the libraries that I use here. Um, speech recognition is using a custom command database, meaning that right now it is a command first voice interface, meaning I process over five or 600 voice commands uh, real time that'll, that'll take uh, precedent before it ever goes to the LLM. If it detects one of those voice commands, it processes those first, and then if it doesn't understand, it'll send it to the LLM. 
uh, that turns about 100 lines of JSON into, like I said, about five or 600 different recognized commands. And that's a custom, uh, custom engine that I wrote to, to, okay. to turn that into voice commands. Have, have you looked at like the Burke intent slot classifiers or that's what we used before LLMs for, for, for like set structures or like voice commands? No, this is Alexa something style. I wrote from scratch. So, uh, oh, yeah. Um, Dave, I had a question. Yeah, Dave. Um, you were saying that right now you're using the object detection uh, from Dusty. Are you, when you're planning on changing that, are you looking to put in like a VLM or something like that where you can say, um, you know, Friday, find me my pencil, and then it will use the VLM to basically be able to track anything? So, no, I mean, I'll probably still re rely on ML for the real time object detection. Um, it already supports VLMs. So, I already have that in the helmet where it will actually, you can ask it to tell me what I'm looking at. And then you can, yeah. once, you, once you ask it to tell me what you're looking at, which is just a voice command, it takes a snapshot, sends that to the VLM. Then you can ask follow up questions about what it, it looked at. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, not re re it's not real time VLM processing. Again, because the VLM isn't local, I can put a LLM locally, but that's just that's just a, a tax deal. Yeah, and like that's a tight fit for like real time VLM on NX while you're doing like 120 hertz rendering. Yes, but, but maybe like I don't know what your GPU utilization is, but to Dave's point, maybe like Al VIT or grounding Dino, so the user could be like directing what the HUD is detecting with open vocab um, could be, that could be a, a cool demo. Yeah, and, what, and one of the other things I wanted to implement was, and the reason I've turned it off for now is I wanted to do eye tracking so that you, you noticed in that original version that I showed you, the object detection is just all over the place. And I would much rather it be like, what am I looking at? And then start detecting what you're looking at rather than just doing the whole screen. Smart, okay, yeah. That, that does make a lot of sense. And I love, there's like gaze models in yeah. how toolkit, and I believe they keep those updated. With the previous Jets and Inference ones, uh, with Tensor RT10 and Jetpack 6.1, a lot of those are like now incompatible. They were like original cafe models and, and quite old by this point. Hence, like modernizing around the um, open vocab detection BITs. Um, Dave, did you have any follow-up questions, or was like your hand just spurred? Uh, I, I couldn't figure out how to put my hand down. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. Hope, um, hope Stan is doing well, by the way. Well, I'm here. Um, oh yeah. Could, uh, could you get like um, an AGX um, and make like a backpack? There is yeah, like I... a giant heat sink on the top. If you take off the heat sink, it's actually not that. Yeah, I mean, I've got an AGX here. I've got a 64 gig AGX that I was actually working on um, using it as a, as a, that being my remote LLM that it switches back and forth between. So th there is a little bit of that, but there's always the power consideration when you're toting these around is that I don't have an arc reactor. And I can talk about that here and I do have some slides on that. Um, speech recognition. Um, Custom command database, like I said, that gets processed first. I am looking to move that, like like what we were talking about um, with with Ross, the idea of of getting the LLM to interpret what I'm asking for and having it call commands uh, rather than having to use that command database. I love the idea of it understanding more of what I'm looking at and handling it from a natural language perspective than having to have a database of commands. Um, but that's that's future and, and not implemented yet. Did you um, say you have 600 of them? 600 what? Commands? Commands. Yeah, that's, it turns, it turns like I said, uh, a, I, you can look at the source code, the JSON's yeah, okay. up there. Yeah, it, uh, but it, it, it turns, yeah. yeah, it just, it just takes like a handful of commands, determines what kinds of commands those are, like if they're Booleans or are they analog or... Yeah. Yeah. And then and then it turns them into all the ways I might say that. OK, yeah, I had done similar things to make the data set for the intent slot classifiers like combinatorial. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Rob, I'm sure we like seem like we're all kind of converging on similar uh, things we're facing here, which is good. 
that, that's why we like have this group and uh, to be able to overcome those those challenges. But my guess is hopefully those can be parameterized so it's like not actually 600 functions because we've seen right. Like, no, no, no. It's okay. it's it's like I said, it's a handful of function. It might be 15 functions. I see. Oh, okay. Well, that could help uh, simplify it. Yeah. No, that's the whole idea though. Is how can I? One of the problems with command processing is I don't want to have to know one command. And I don't want to have to say it the same way every time. I want it to feel natural. And so if I can expand that command processing into a bunch of ways I might say it and then understand what I'm asking for. Yeah. The one thing that you might be up against, like anytime, I'm sure you've seen the LLM uses GPU, it's like blocked, you know, because it consumes a lot. If you do have low enough level access, and I've had chat with Mizeko about this, and um, like can control the actual processing loop of the LLM, you can sleep after like each token. So it will give your audio and video rendering loops a chance to um, maintain priority. Right, right. Um, so I do have a local LLM running on the device now because I, I try to do as much on the edge as possible. Um, but I also now support the idea of failover from cloud to local. So it, it there's an automatic detection on whether you have access to the cloud. Uh, and if you do not have, so if, if cloud is your default, for example, because you want access to larger LLMs or you like OpenAI's API, but you're running the local LLM, if it detects that the, the cloud has disappeared on you, it will automatically fall back to your local LLM, keeping context from your cloud LLM, and you can actually switch back and forth dynamically, or you can actually use a voice command to switch back and forth whenever you feel like it. That's really nifty, actually. It maintains the context. Yeah. Um, uh, since I'm using, yeah. since I'm currently using OpenAI's API for both Llama CPP and OpenAI, it's easy to maintain that that same context, and you just pass it back and forth between. Yeah. Them. Yeah. And uh, I meant to mention um, Shaki's at latest blog today. He's been posting a bunch of stuff about using like K3S and like distributed balance. Now, now that these open AI servers have become like quite robust and full featured, including function calling and multimodal support. And we have the container to spin up, being able to like orchestrate those, load balance them and distribute them across your jets. And he has some like cool articles about that. Um, it, it like to the edge to cloud stack essentially that used to be shown. Yep. Uh, some of the software I'm using, I've already talked about some of it. SDL for 2D graphics, GStreamer for video. I'm using Piper for speech synthesis, which I really like the way it does it. I'm not a big fan of like the over emotional uh, sound of some of these like ones that are trying to emulate human speech. I actually like it to sound. I want it to sound realistic, but I'm not really looking for it to sound human, if you know what I mean. Um, so I'm going with Piper currently, and it had a fantastic um, Scottish accent that I really liked. So I went with that one. Um, Voss, I remember it, at the beginning of the summer, we like ported Piper through the Home Assistant thing. And I like Dave, he's trained TTS models through Riva. And sometimes, yeah, the, the best ones are sound a little computerized. And Piper has like thousands of voices yeah. too. I just clicked until I found one that was like cool and it's super fast. Um, yes, it is. A Piper, I really like it as my speech synthesis. It does a good job. Um, Vosk for touch to speech currently, which is using Kaldi. Uh, Llama CPP for my local LM. I'm currently using Google Gemma 2, uh, 2B. Uh, it's just, I've even tried the new Llama ones and I'm still really liking the Gemma 2 2B. Uh, for the interactions that I have with it, uh, it seems to be the most accurate, it, the most concise. I'm just, I've been very impressed with how well it runs. Azir really likes Gemma too, also. And people do seem to like that SLM. And um, I, I just retested Llama C++ performance last night on Hovering, actually. And it, it is about 25 to 30% slower than MLC. And they both have the same um, open AI compatible servers. Okay. And the, these articles from Shaggy's that I mentioned show the steps to like spinning one of those up versus 
um, the Llama C++ version. So should you encounter like a future bottleneck around this and need to either streamline the performance or want faster LLM, that would I would look uh, to that next. But it, like this is a very impressive multimodal stack that you have all integrating together here into like a cohesive streaming experience that like if it doesn't lag <laughs> the top, so that's that's awesome yeah uh going in just some of the cool tech notes that i put here at the end uh video responsive time in software from like the moment i get a video frame to the moment i'm done with the video frame it's around 20 milliseconds um thanks rob um and uh, end to end, which includes hardware latency, you got to include the display latency and the camera latency. It's about an 80 millisecond response time. And I know, Dusty, you you had commented that you were really impressed with the latency when you wore it yourself. I, I was. And then I've seen people on LinkedIn that are showing like 30 millisecond with CSI glass to glass and like no idea how these people are like wizards with the camera stack. Jetpack 6.1 did reduce um, CSI overhead a lot and so CPU. i have not i have not tested it recently this was like a year ago okay yeah might, so be, it's, might it's, be worth checking again it, it yeah. may be worth redoing it yeah these people will like fiddle with the pipeline and shave off all them i i did not really notice like lag in it i think you even said that was with the recording going so yes yeah, so that was with recording which is going to yeah. have like a 30 frames per second instead of 120. people do be very driven with it though and i understand yeah well and, and keep in mind Mine isn't glass to glass. Mine actually is having to do overlays on top of it. So it is glass to glass from a timing perspective, but mine isn't just taking camera and seeing how fast I can get it to the display. I actually have to pull it into my pipeline, do the video manipulation for the overlay, and then send it back out. Right. Yeah. And we have to do that particularly for object detection, obviously, once we start doing that again. Um, again, it offers full experience recording to disk. It will live stream directly from the helmet to YouTube, RTSP, UDP. Uh, I've actually done a live stream in my uh, garage directly to YouTube. Doesn't work as well when you're on a show floor and have to deal with all that mess. I've tried to do that several times and it hasn't worked out. Um, some of my latest enhancements I've been doing over the past few months. Uh, I've I was inspired by your work, Dusty, on making the the uh, AI agent interruptible where you could have a conversation you could interrupt it and so i wrote some of my code to do that myself so now you can interrupt her while she's t talking if you don't ask her anything else but you're just talking she'll pick up where she left off if you ask her something new it stops about what it was talking about and then runs a new query uh, you can just ask it to cancel it understands those commands um, i'm always working to improve the responsiveness of the agent uh, and then uh, the HUD now has a dynamic full screen mode, which I didn't have before, which now basically the HUD will take up any size display. It doesn't have to just be 2880 by 1440, even if that's the native rendering. Uh, I have a HUD AI element, which I'm showing here on the right side of the screen, uh, which now one of the biggest problems when dealing with an AI agent when you're in a HUD is you don't know if it heard you. You don't know what its state is. You'll talk to it and you'll be like, did you hear me? Are you processing this? And so I added this little LED, virtual LED in the upper right hand corner of the display. You can see this, this Friday up here with this green dot. Uh, and that dot changes colors depending on the status of the AI agent. And so if I'm speaking to her, uh, it will go from green, green is idle. Then it'll go to purple if it's listening. If it's processing, it'll be red so that I can keep up with whether it heard me or not very important when you're in a helmet and have no other feedback as to whether it's processing. Yeah, yeah. I think in mine, I just added like a beep or something, but but you were, it's absolutely essential actually. And all these like HMI things that you learn through this about like nuance yeah. of conversations, it, it's a lot to like encode into the pipeline when it's all like parallelized and queued and stuff. Maybe you Couple. could put like a graph or something. So it would tell you how much volume it is listening because if there's a lot of sound around you maybe it will get all mixed up with other sounds so even though it's showing the purple it doesn't mean that it's listening to you it may be listening to a bunch of stuff from outside and then i'm so, sitting here yeah so there's two notes on that um first of all i i handle it via two methods 
Uh, I do a volume level um, check when you first turn on the device that could actually be run rerun multiple times during your process to figure out what your background volume is. I also do word detection as a way to tell whether it should be listening. So if it's just hearing noise, but it's not actual words, it can determine the difference. Um, and the beauty of being in a helmet, it's generally much quieter than it is everywhere around you. And so it doesn't impact the microphone nearly as much um, uh, as, as you, you would add, think. Could you add a microphone to the outside of the helmet and then cancel whatever that hears from the internal mic? I was, I was going to say that there must be some kind of gear hub or something for noise canceling. Sure. That, there, sure. It's a standard that, that would be good. Yeah, it's called yeah, VAD. Yeah. Voice yeah, and, and, and in fact, part. And in fact, part of the the experience capturing that I was mentioning before, where it's recording everything, I am planning on in the next version of the helmet adding stereo mics to the left and the right ear to enhance your hearing as well as to record the stereo sound. And then, like you were saying, I could use that as a cancellation for the AI assistant as well. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. If you have like one of those re speakers with beam forming, or I whatnot. do have one, but nice. that wouldn't work yeah. very well in the helmet. But similar technology, just building it into a helmet format. Yeah. If if the noise thing ever becomes an issue, these voice activity detection models they're super small, and the I use those in the in those other agents too. Yeah, Paul, you're muted, sir. That's yes, all right. What about hearing aids? Because hearing aids, you can do virtually anything with them. You're talking about integrating hearing aids into the helmet? Yes. I have not had any experience with hearing aids, but it, it's an interesting idea, especially since they're but they're you, built you, into you your ear at that point. Noise. Yeah, and just, or, just, of... or just like in-ear earbuds. It could be an option too. Well, well right now, I mean, the yeah, helmet I mean, already has headphones built into the helmet. So you do have audio directly coming that you can listen to music on, that you will listen to your AI assistant. And like I said, in a future version of the helmet, it will also be um, the ability to enhance your hearing so that you can hear better about what's going on around you since it's muffled by the helmet anyway. All right, let me... See if I can get through this. I know we're already over time. I see people dropping oh, off, but yeah, it's it's cool. The a surprising amount of people still on. Yeah. Okay. Um, other cool tech notes on here. Uh, working towards complete configuration via JSON. Um, the UI elements are all JSON configured at this point. So if you want to build a version of this, you can configure that UI to look however you want. You can build your own graphics. You can replace the graphics that I have in different places. You can turn them on and off. There are voice commands to turn everything off and on. And again, that's all via JSON because I knew at some point I would want a Halo helmet or I would want some other HUD that you know isn't Iron Man. And so I wanted to be to make it configurable. Uh, and then there's a lot of settings that are configurable in the JSON today that configure how the helmet works. Uh, and I want to pull more and more of the settings that are now in a defines file. And I want to pull more of those into that JSON format. Uh, one of the things I did not too long ago is I used NVIDIA's power estimator to make a custom power profile for this helmet. Uh, that became absolutely necessary when I started running a local LLM because the local LLM was not running fast enough with any of my default power settings or everything was getting throttled. Uh, so I developed one of my own that is a 28 and a half watt power, and it seems to be keeping it from throttling in almost every situation. Uh, and again, I'm focused on the full clock speed of the GPU, which makes the LLM a lot more responsive. Uh, and I have all of the, the CPU cores, and I just clock those down a little bit to keep the power usage down. Yeah, this is a great use case for this tool, actually, where you did. It was fact, wonderful but... how well I could iterate on the power usage because, you know, it used to either be all on or I would set it to something and then I'd get throttling. And, you know, as an embedded developer, my idea is to keep this system as steady state as possible. And so when it throttles, that was bad or, you know, I didn't want the CPU 
usage or, or you know GPU usage to surge up and cause problems with with some other part of the system. Yeah, these kind of factors with embedded systems can't be understated enough and um, seem to be all, all forgotten anymore. That's great. And one one thing I also wanted to do was make the whole system modular. So there's a lot of components that know how to speak to each other. Um, so you have Aura, which is the helmet that run, or which is the actual uh, Arduino code that runs in the helmet. Like I said, that does all of the co-processing, all the early processing for the sensor array that's in the helmet. Uh, you have Dawn, which is my AI assistant code, uh, which can be run standalone, which is what I'm working on now on my AGX that I have on my desk is making it a standalone assistant that I can use around the home. Um, want to you know do home automation integration. Um, and then Mirage, which is the heads up display code. Uh, and then Spark, which is pretty much all the other sensors that are going into the armor. That that means it's got your hand sensing for repulsors if you're doing cosplay and things like that. It could obviously also be used for um, for uh, uh, gesture recognition and things like that. I love um, your acronyms, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks to AI for all the wonderful acronyms, because <laughs> yeah. that was a lot of workshopping to get good acronyms I was happy with. Uh, um, be before we move on, once, um, there was somebody from the chat that, yeah. that had a question. Ramya? Yes. Uh, when you turned, uh, when you made your own custom power profile, did you intentionally turn off certain CPUs, or um, did you do anything um, like that to keep your power low or, um, I, or at the right you know uh, value yeah so with i wanted to keep as much parallel processing ability as possible again keeping the system responsive is is the most important thing so when it came to the cpus it was much more important for me to like keep all eight cores on but turn down their clock speed okay. which saves a lot of power particularly under high load high stress situations um so yeah, but the tool's fantastic because I could have gone for less cores, more speed if I wanted to, but instead I went for more parallelization, less speed. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just, I was gonna you know, talk about kind of what I wanna do next. Uh, as far as fit and features, uh, I'm going to try to get rid of the camera visibility from a cosplay perspective. People don't like seeing the cameras, so I have some ideas that I'm doing there on version two of this helmet. Uh, I'm always trying to shrink down the size of the helmet, but optics is a real thing, and optics is a problem when you're trying to shrink down something that you have to have a certain amount of space between you and the the uh, the displays. Um, the next version, I am trying to switch my uh, by speech to text to whisper.cpp, it has a lot less overhead and it seems to be more accurate than the one I'm using. Uh, but given the fact that it's a, a different library, it just takes time to implement a new library. Uh, the native Llama CPP integration, instead of using the API, uh, the, the OpenAI API, which is using the socket, uh, because I think I could get a lot more performance and uh, reaction time out of I, using the native. Chris, I, I don't think that you will, man. You spend the time trying MLC instead. Okay. It'll instantly give you 25%. And like the little API overhead is not going to outbalance huge LLM kernels. Um, okay. It okay. is like, what, and yeah, the, the all the benchmarks that, that we show are with those, those other ones. But fortunately, it's like the same open AI thing. So even I myself, I'm like for text LLM these days, like just stick with open AI when the token rate is like 20, 30, 40 tokens a second, that is negligible impact for for those protocols. Okay. And unless you it's get to like the multimodal stuff. I, I would, and you can just spin up the container quick and give it a try. There is a, it is a little more in depth to like build and quantize the model. Um, so it is it's slightly harder to use, but the perf is like worth it. And that's what we use for all the VLM stuff too. Okay. Uh, Ramya? Do you have another? I'm, I'm so sorry. I forgot to. Um, okay. 
take my head down. No problem. A version of two of the helmet, uh, new sensors, new environmental sensing. I know there was a question about like CO2 sensing. I've got some new environmental sensors sitting right in front of me that I'm going to be implementing in the helmet. Um, Luckily, since everything is modular, it's really nice that I can go and implement new uh, helmet sensors just write a little JSON processing, and then all of a sudden I have the ability to process that. Uh, I have a health monitor, so I can actually monitor my health real time. Um, just something I wear on my arm that will actually give it real time data, again, via JSON, and then I can process that, new new UI elements to go with that. Uh, the version two has a new display. It's an OLED display that's curved around the front of the, the helmet to free up some more space. Uh, in the helmet, uh, and and it's a new model helmet that has different uh, geometry. So that was the point of doing that. Uh, again, more interactive UI with eye and hand tracking. That's uh, a little bit further down the road, but something I want to implement. Uh, and then possibly I'd like to do some real 3D graphics instead of the 2D overlay, uh, but I have to teach myself 3D gaming programming in order to do that. So. Uh, that's also on my list. Uh, and one of the the techs I'd really like to play with are transparent displays, uh, but I have a real tough time getting my hand on transparent displays being not a company and not someone trying to produce technology with it. It's awesome with these sensors. You like recording all the data. I was like, yeah, record that because then you can like train the yes. Oasis agent to be you. Yep. And then, um, so I I haven't mentioned it to this point, OASIS stands for Open Armor Systems Integrated Suite. Again, the idea of it being uh, an integrated suite of different applications that all can talk to one another. Uh, It is open source. You can get to everything via the GitHub repo at this time. Um, You know, I just want to empower the community to take this, uh, build their own out of it. I know it from from a cost perspective, it's a bit hefty. Uh, to to buy the jets and to buy the displays. There's a lot of hardware involved in building this, um, but you can get going with just the jets. And, and then again, with everything being modular, you can take pieces of it and work on it as you you have the, the resources to do so. You know, and I'm always looking for practical uses for this. And so if I can do things with motorcycle helmets or automotive windshields, uh, that would be kind of an end use case for real world applications. That would be interesting if you tied it into that, wouldn't it? And I got GTC, I remember I saw like a vision language model, vision assistant device for yes. blind people. So yeah. it's like basically there, one there, the same, you know? there have been some um, research uh, institutes that have contacted me that would like to use this for research. I'm like, please do. Let okay. me know if you have any questions. Um, again, this is the, here are the links that I've already provided in the chat on where you can get the source. Um, Thanks, Chris. Uh, and then these were some more interactions. You can find these again, since I don't have audio, I won't go into these. Uh, you can actually see them here since they're um, since the text is on the screen. Uh, but these shorts are up on, like I said, Instagram. They're on uh, uh, YouTube as well. Uh, and these are just some shorts that I do outlining some of my newest technologies that I'm working on for each of these systems. Thanks, man. It's like, you know, and into this. and then this is this is one last video. Uh, this is a set of sensors that I'm building that will go into different components of the suit. So this thing, this will have, for example, this one just has environmental and battery monitoring uh, so that you can run LEDs in various portions of your suit so that you can do environmental sensing to see how temperatures are going in various portions of the suit. Uh, And like I said, since it monitors battery, you will know if one part has a battery left or if it's draining. Um, And this is really nice. Again, I'm trying to solve problems with cosplay as well. Uh, One of the things that I wanted to build the helmet for is because Iron Man helmets are terrible to see out of. You can't see anything with the helmet down. And so most people put the faceplate up when they're having to walk around. This solves that problem. Um, the other thing is, is most Iron Man suits are heavily wired because there's LEDs everywhere and they wire that off of a central battery. Mine is more of a distributed system where each one of these has its own battery. It's in your leg. So once you put on the suit, you can hit a button on a remote control. It turns all of the systems on and then they communicate back 
to the helmet with all of your sensor data. And so that is already working. That My biggest thing here is just finding protocols, uh, wireless protocols that work really well in very congested situations. Uh, this was originally designed with Wi-Fi, but I'm finding Wi-Fi does not work well in almost any situation like at a convention because of how congested the spectrums are when you're at the conventions. Uh, so I'm looking at the, the, the different Bluetooth technologies to see if they do better in congested areas or even some of the nine, 900 megahertz technologies such as LoRa uh, to potentially be able to do this that are less congested. Um, and I think that's it. These are the last two slides uh, just showing the channels, uh, but I'm going to open it up to, to any questions or comments. It's wild how far down the rabbit hole you go <laughs> on this, Chris. And I, I truly hope in like the future you're able to parlay this into some. I mean, I know you already have like a great job. And this is like a, a, a side project or whatever, but like you could do even like amazing stuff with this as is or all these other amazing assistive applications with it. Um, thank you so much for opening all this, sharing it all with us. It's, um, you know, brought science fiction to life faster than, you know, anybody would have expected, really. And now you're going to, like, build the suit. That, that's, yep. that's yeah. The suit, the <laughs> so suit you, is currently my too. current project. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, it will I, be. Nice. But as you, you know, yeah, as you know, Dusty, I get, like, as a software developer, I keep coming back, like, there's the physical suit I need to build, but this is so much fun to develop from a software I perspective. I know. I'm trying to dedicate one day a week to physical <laughs> robot work, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna do it. Uh, but it's again, like things take priority on like the AI side. That's so fast moving. Uh, Colin, you had another question, man. Yeah, please. Oh yeah. Well, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, I'd be interested in kind of contributing. I'm. I'm uh I'm working. I was just kind of experimenting with some of uh, some of that stuff for blind people because my my mother-in-law has dementia and is blind as well. So um you know navigating her own house is uh, it was a challenge when I saw that. So I've I've been kind of goofing around with um embedded systems and putting kind of the LLM not just Llama CPP but you know, reducing the size of even that, if possible. Yeah, um, I'm available on almost every social media platform, so you can message me on any of those. Uh, my email address is public. It's chris at kerseyfabrications.com, um, so you can email me directly. Uh, you can also find me on a number of different Discord servers, which I won't list at this time, but I'm also oh, sure. on Discord. Okay. All right. I think the, like, these vision language navigation models could be great for this, where the helmet actually speaks oh, nice. to you, the, the waypoint navigation, which might be like not super shiny or whatnot for your um, no, like, I mean, it, movie it, it's, demo, but that is like practical. It, right? It's a use case. I mean, I always look at the practical use cases for this. And so one of the use cases, like it already has a Google map in it. There's a GPS in okay. it. There's the, already the Google map in the, the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Um, so I want to expand that because right now it's not really a real time map. It takes a snapshot like every 30 seconds. That's configurable, but it takes a snapshot of where you are 30, every 30 seconds. But I'd love to turn that in okay. to real time navigation and real time tracking. Yeah. But right now, the, the easiest way for me to implement that was through Google static maps API. And I just send it that and I get an image back and I display the image. But they have obviously, for apps and stuff, the ability to pull down a live, uh, a live stream of, yeah, of content. And I think this could also tie in with your desire to move to 3D because we've been looking at nerfs and more recently the Gaussian splatting, which will essentially, you know, train this photorealistic 3D representation of a scene that you can capture from this helmet with the inertial data for the poses and then be instantly able to like reproject that from other angles or like have the user move in it but i think it could be very compelling in that helmet form factor and i had earlier in the meeting i'd sent out i think colin had asked about the these blm 
mini VLM models. And I'm starting to look at these workflows for, for doing just that. Um, where ideally you would just like walk in, scan your environment, mm -hmm. uh, train the NERF, train the VLN navigation model or, or whatever token streaming state machine that like you define for um, your agent based on your, your data. So that, that's one of the other motivations to designing my own helmet is that uh, the Iron Man helmet is a very constraining form factor. It's, it's very form fitting. It's supposed to look sleek. Um, but, you know, like a helmet such as like the helmet, the Halo helmet is much more practical. There's a lot of room for sensors. I could put a lot more data that I could integrate into um, into the HUD. Uh, you know, like you're saying, like mapping projections, you know, doing, uh, you know, environmental mapping, doing, you know, HUD elements that told you which way to go if you're navigating a, a city street, integrating real Google map support, that kind of thing um, would be a lot easier if my helmet wasn't so constraining. And so when I'm going for my custom design, there's a lot of practicality I'm adding to that design rather than it having to be as... I guess it'll still look sci-fi, but not Iron Man sci-fi. Like I said, more like a Halo or or a, a more practical design, a more unfortunately militaristic. But you, I think you know what I mean there. The those are a lot more practical in function. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any other questions from the group? We are coming up to thirty past the hour, which is. Should just change the invite. For I was going to say that that's not becoming our new normal. It, and it's fine because this stuff is so awesome. And thank you for taking the time to deep dive us on it. And I believe that just like with um, you know JPL's project, there are a number of people uh, in this group like interested in this. And it it's funny what has started as you know you were a huge fan of the movies and the tech actually has like real world applications to it so um yeah thank you chris for wanting to share that and putting all this extra work in to maintaining it and and hope that we are all able to to take advantage if i can do anything to help you like building the containers or with these vision language models or if you have any issues with the different inference runtimes or the um servers please don't hesitate to to let me know um any closing thoughts or parting words from your end or any other questions from the group um if, if any if anyone pulls it down takes a look at the code please keep in mind that uh it's a, a lot of work and i and i try to keep my documentation up to date but the documentation may not be quite up to date as fast as i sometimes sit down and and develop the new features um so if you see something out of date or something that doesn't make any sense to you please ping me like I said, I'm I'm more than happy for anyone to contact me uh, about questions or comments or or if they want to contribute and don't understand why I did something a certain way. Uh, uh, again, most of the the code here is just my way of doing it. So if you've got a better way or a better piece of technology you would like to to see integrated, please let me know. I'm I'm all ears. Thanks, Chris. It is extremely difficult to keep up with like all the docs and everything these days on top of everything else. And your your stack is very impressive that you've integrated together end to end. And like that's a lot of work. I know in addition to all the hardware. So don't don't be too hard on yourself about the docs. I'm like so behind on it all. Johnny's helping. We're all just like um yeah, hopping in here. Yes, we're using Flash and Fur. We got like everything building here. You can go off it try any of this stuff that you want, whatever your favorite is. Uh, Brett, uh, did, did you yeah. uh, I, have a question? I just question? had one, one thing to say. Uh, Chris, uh, incredible project. I mean, it's outrageous. Um, and I only say this, uh, I don't know, half in jest. Um, I have a suggestion in jest uh, to spray paint that thing OD green and just walk over to like DOD US Army folks. They'll... <laughs> And all, then all I ask is that you remember me when you're flying around on your private jet and, you know, occasionally pick me up. Um, yeah, they would love it. Yes, <laughs> they, I, they would really love it. I can love make, those, and, I uh, can make yeah. those connections. There we go. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. It wouldn't, like, people in this group 
do go off and like connect with each other and, and things have started happening for like lots of different people on this. So Chris, I, if that, you know, keep your avenues open or pursue at this point, world's your oyster to pursue what you want with this. Cause like nobody is at this level. So congrats, man. And, and keep sure. it up. I know it's a sure. lot of late, a lot of late nights working on that. So cheers. Um, all right. Any other closing questions, comments, concerns, or input on direction the next few weeks from the group here? Um, if not, we will reconvene in another two weeks on, um, it, it's looking like Tuesday, November 12th. All right. So, um, barring that, we'll catch you guys again then. Thanks again to Chris and Rob from JPL, all of our speakers today. Really appreciate it. Awesome session, guys. The, the, being part of this group has just um, been really fantastic. So I can't believe it's been over six months since GTC and we started this. And uh, there's it, things are getting you know more outlandish and wild every day with this. Last time, you know, Dave had Stanley on, and yeah, I think you're going to work with him too, Chris. So. And that's good. And you can have your suit and your humanoid buddy to go along with it and all the data you need to train him. So, all right. Thank you, everyone who is still on. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Um, thanks again and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Man. Thanks, Dustin. See you, Brett. Yeah, see you guys.